The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Jaime. And of course, if anyone asks the question, what are the Social Justice Forums all about? Well, we take a look at many of the inequities that people face, particularly in communities of color. We talk about discrimination. We talk about civil, uh, civic engagement. And then we also promote an opportunity for you to actually get involved and to be informed. We encourage you. We got a very special show coming up. Stay with us. The Social Justice Forums begins right now. Welcome back. Greenlining Realty USA is a national real estate development and management firm that's actually working in partnership with local municipalities throughout the country, creating mixed use developments with large scale economic impact. Dedicated to reversing the historic effect of redlining in low income communities through developing quality housing and vibrant commercial quarters, Greenlining Realty USA creates pathways to capital essential for neighborhood investment redevelopment, home improvement, as well as housing rehabilitation. Joining us now is the founding principal at Greenlining Realty USA, Lamel McMorris. And uh, Lamel, glad to have you here on the show. Glad to be here. Thank you, Darren. Glad to have you sharing in this topic. And uh, when we talk about your company, it's very specific, uh, dealing with a lot of what I said in the intro, uh, many of the inequities that people face, particularly in the housing market, for those who may not be so familiar, a little bit more about your company. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, uh, thanks again for having me. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting that uh, the focus of, of uh, your show is social justice. And uh, I think it's important for people to see uh, housing as a racial justice issue. And it, uh, you know, founding Greenlining in 2016 uh, in my hometown and in the neighborhood where I grew up of Chicago in an area called Woodlawn, which is a, you know, a, a historic black community similar to that in the Bronx, similar to that in LA, similar to that Shaw in DC, where it was in these historic areas uh, where this practice of redlining, a, a serious disinvestment uh, in communities where government, uh, housing agencies, banks deliberately drew lines around certain communities. And so in 2016, I was really just on the porch of uh, my childhood home. And I looked around and saw some of the same vacant lots and blighted properties. And uh, I'm, I'm crazy. I, you know, I define an entrepreneur as someone who goes on top of a building and jumps off and figures out how they're gonna land on the way down. I didn't necessarily have any background extensively in real estate development or building homes. I just simply said, you know, this is a way that I choose to lean in based upon what I'm seeing uh, in my community. And so I knew that uh, one of the reasons why my community and others like it are in the condition that they're in today is because of this historic practice called redline, redlining, and it was centered around housing disinvestment. And I said, hey, I'm going to uh, green line where they drew red lines. I'm going to green line and I'm going to do it through housing. It's not the only way, uh, but it is one way that we've chosen to lean back in into historic uh, disinvested communities. And when we look at some of these communities, these communities are not just disinvested, but we also see massive gentrification, particularly in urban neighborhoods where we see urban neighborhoods and the whole structure, the whole vibrancy of that neighborhood has changed. It loses its cultural, uh, its cultural foundation. And we know that in many ways, this is intentional. How do we go about really uh, changing the, uh, first of all, the final result and also this, you know, wrong narrative? One of the questions is how do we equitably uh, redevelop historic black neighborhoods without displacement? Gentrification does not necessarily have to be a bad word and it especially does not have to be a bad thing for black and brown people. The challenge and the question is how do we equitably, equitably 
reinvest and develop these communities without people being displaced. And so if you look at it uh, from through the lens of equity, so it's simply saying that the bones of my neighborhood in Woodlawn on the south side of Chicago are no different than the neighborhoods on the north side. The only difference is a lack of investment. And when we do invest, it doesn't mean that the folks in my community are not worthy of livable, walkable, playable amenities in a, a, a vibing, vibrant commercial corridor where restaurant, dining, entertainment opportunities. The neighborhood should not have to change. My neighborhood, my folks and folks that look like you and I are worthy of the same amenities. And so we shouldn't look at gentrification. And then, you know, everyone is welcome to move into thriving communities. It's just about equity. So we're saying that the same investment, because the same bones of the community on my side of town are worthy as the other side of town. In the Bronx are worthy as Manhattan. In Inglewood in LA is worthy as, because the same bones exist, in in uh, as as those in uh, Beverly Hills, uh, for example, that the historic neighborhood of Shaw is just as worthy as Northwest uh, Washington D.C. and Northeast and Southeast D.C. is just as worthy as Northwest D.C. And just because you do come in and invest and new people move in, the historic community, uh, which typically be typically are those of color should not be displaced. How do we get this uh, area of investment in the neighborhoods? I mean, obviously, I think that you've got uh, great information that you can probably share with us about what are some of the best ways that we can really approach this to enhance neighborhoods? Well, listen, um, I can only really go through my story and, and my testimony. I think, I think hopefully what uh, some of your viewers and, and listeners will see a couple of takeaways are one, it's just like the rapper said, you know, at some point we've got to go buy back the block. I am, I have worked in, in as an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a kid from my neighborhood. I decided that I was going to go back. I'm not some multi-millionaire, billionaire, uh, but I did this through partnerships, which I've learned early on in my career, that there are agencies uh, that are designed like the National Community Reinvestment Coalition who partner with us as an entity out of Washington, DC, whose mandate and mission is to go back in these communities. And then, you know, I looked at the organizations that have been doing the work in my neighborhood, which was the YWCA, uh, which is an entity called Sunshine Gospel. Sometimes it's not always the quote unquote blue chip organizations in every community they're folks that have been doing the work. And so part of this comes through, you know, going to financial institutions and other nonprofits that have a mandate for doing this work and then partnering with the existing because it's all about bringing everyone up at the same time. I am not some savior coming to my neighborhood or any community uh, to redevelop. I think we have what we need. A lot of times it's not been coalesced. A lot of times it's, there's not been partnership. Uh, and a lot of times we've just, frankly, it's just not been a will. And folks have not beat on the table to say, hey, our communities are worthy. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be displaced in order for our communities to be vibrant. And it comes with both outside of in the nonprofit world. And then I think we have to really put forth real serious policy changes and policy opportunities. One example, of, of an effort from a policy standpoint to redress systemic and historic racism, whether it be in housing or education. But in this case, in housing is what was done in the city of Evanston, Illinois, where they were very deliberate, tangible. If you wanna repair issues of reparative justice and talk about, if you will, reparations and how to repair systemic inequities, they decided from a, le a local legislative standpoint to do it around housing. And they have legislation specifically and funds designated around housing for those who can prove during a certain time frame in certain communities that were disenfranchised, disinvested and experienced this type of uh, segregation. There are funds set aside for home improvement, for down payment assistance, 
uh, for those who have been historically uh, 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 disadvantaged. Yeah. And I think uh, what, what was done in Evanston, again, connected to a tangible outcome around a real systemic issue is an example of what we can do, not just on the federal level, but in local communities uh, around the country. When you talk about passing a reparations bill, of course, Evanston is unique in its own right, but it's something that can be accomplished. I think when you look at what happened in Evanston, a lot of people can say, listen, it's happened here. It can happen over here. But we know that sometimes policy, uh, elected officials, and, and simply uh, red tape gets right. in the way. But we do know and we do have evidence that this actually works. Yeah, listen, uh, we're talking uh, 50 to 100 years of deliberate systemic, uh, and if you, frankly, we can go longer over three or 400 years, but specifically around housing in uh, urban communities, especially, we're talking about 50 you know, uh, to 100 years of uh, uh, legalized segregation and disinvestment. So it's not gonna get, my point is, it's not gonna get done overnight. Small, and, and the key word to what I said in relation to Evanston, Illinois in particular is tangible outcomes, right? Connected to historic systemic inequities. So housing is just one, right? We've got educational outcomes that we need to uh, work on. We've got health care outcomes that we need to work on. We have basic economic development and job opportunity and creation outcomes to work on. The model though is, look, we have a local municipality that technically sits outside of an urban, but still it gives us, a, it gives us model legislation on a local level that should and can be duplicated on a state level and ultimately on a federal level. And that's what we need to start with. And I hope that uh, your listeners in the New York area will really take a hard look at Evanston, Illinois, and what they did around reparative justice, and particularly housing and making uh, a model of reparations legislation on the local level. Yeah. I know you got eyes to the map, boots on the ground when it comes to the whole issue of redlining. How bad is it getting across America? Uh, it is, it is, uh, we're, you know, we're in crisis mode right now. Uh, in every community, both urban and, and rural, we still see the remnants of red lines being drawn in the 1920s from legalized segregation in this country. And, you know, you can't disconnect some of the effects of that. Ed poor education outcomes, poor health outcomes, a remarkable wealth and home ownership gap that is actually wider today than it was in the 1920s when it comes to the ownership of white households uh, to black households and the wealth gap that when you can pass down property and you can use property to buy businesses, to increase your wealth and to build your family, then, and, and if one community was disenfranchised and not, and where there were delivered, we could actually draw and put the red line maps from California all the way uh, to New York and see that those, where those red lines were drawn in uh, over 80 plus years ago, we still see the effects of uh, a tremendous wealth and housing gap. And so it's crisis mode. Uh, it was good to, to hear the president uh, address the other day uh, that they're going to take very deliberate steps uh, in the in the in housing to address historic inequities. Uh, but that policy uh, must be connected directly from a federal level to local communities and uh, with the responsibility for the private sector and others to step up. You use the word local communities, and uh, they are really the, the, the big it factor. They're the ones that can actually make it happen. You talk about Evanston, Illinois. That was a local community that really made, made a decision. What can a local community continue to do to try to really change the trajectory of what we're seeing that's impacting so many people, and particularly communities of color? Yeah, I, I think um, for a long time, uh, we have... 
uh, you know, we've seen the power of uh, nonviolent direct action, uh, marching, uh, raising our voices in the streets. Now, I think it is time for us to take the lesson of uh, the civil rights legacy and the civil rights movement where issues were dramatized, but directly to the dramatization of those issues were direct policy, federal, local, legislative outcomes. I think that's where we are uh, today, Darren. I think, I think we're at a point where uh, policy and laws have to drive the outcome and the ultimate liberation that we're looking for uh, in our communities. It, it, um, when, when, when the law is set up and written against you, even if you do have and you can wrangle investment and new dollars, you're not gonna get the outcome. Uh, right. Ours has to be uh, legalized efforts to redress historic and systemic wrongs. Yeah, you, you talk about that. And that's so, you know, even though there's still some more work that has to be done, even if you do have the money, uh, there's still policy and laws that actually that actually challenge things. Uh, so give us a little bit about where you are today and, uh, and the work that you're actually doing. You know, I'm excited about uh, not just what I'm doing in, in my local community and we've been able on, on my block literally to start with my childhood home, which has been in my family for 60 plus years to actually building new homes on the block, uh, uh, which is infrastructure my neighborhood has is, is not seen. But, but I'm also, uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, I think we're seeing uh, in the wake of a renewed emphasis on racial and social justice issues in the middle of this global pandemic where, where in, inequities have been heightened and dramatized even more. I, I'm hopeful that there will be the continued momentum uh, that we've seen, not just in public sector uh, political rhetoric, but even in private sector corporate uh, rhetoric and not just words, but deeds. Uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm excited because I think the, the eyes of various corporations have been open. I think they are making beyond just throwing, you know, some dollars at situations. I think there are examples of corporations that are trying to take a very hard and deliberate look around how they show up in community, how they are real good, tangible corporate citizens. Uh, I'm hopeful. And, and that's the part of the work that I'm engaged in through my work in DC and what I've done from a, a government relations and policy standpoint for 19 years now. But, but it's the connection of the, the word and, and the deed and the actual practical, as you said, on the ground and the policy uh, that happens. Uh, I'm excited about closing that gap and what I think it lies ahead. I think you also do, you, you really touch upon something that really the transformation of a community begins one block at a time, one house at a time, really. And you grab the bull by the horns and really doing that. I think so many times people try to grab the big picture, but you know, we do understand that there is something for doing it incrementally, one house at a time can actually make a difference. Yeah, and that's and that's what I hope. Uh listen, I'm I'm not as young as I'd like to think I am. Uh <laughs> I, but I hope. Uh, I do serve as a model for some of our peers. There, there really is some truth to this notion that when you drop a pebble in the water, the remarkable ripple effect that that can have is monumental. And, and I think if some of our colleagues and some of our friends would not think that they need to, you know, have millions of dollars and, and redo, to your point, the entire neighborhood, just start with a couple of blighted properties. Uh, on the block that, and rehab and and lean in and learn and, and make some mistakes and and you know have some hard lessons. But if we don't do that, because sometimes Darren, we can't wait for the lo the the local or the federal legislation. Sometimes some of us just have to get in and make it happen for our communities. And that's really, I hope, what what my narrative and what we've done. Uh, yeah. And what advice do you have for somebody who may not have the capital, right? Maybe I got a couple of houses on my block I could do something with. I don't necessarily have the capital. How do I turn the corner and being able to do that? I have the heart, just like you say. 
want to see it done, want to be able to done. I can't do the big thing, but there's certainly something that I could be able to do. How do I get my foot in the door and what do I do? Yeah, I think I think first thing I can only go by by my story. We didn't we didn't have the capital. The first thing I did was go to the local uh, city and county resources to see what they are doing in the way of turning these communities around. And you know how are cities and municipalities uh, galvanizing properties in certain communities for Rhea? There are programs. I cannot spout out every program from New York to California, but I assure you. Uh, the investigation needs to happen. If you are interested, lean in to and find out to uh, in your local housing departments, both on a, a, a local city, uh, town and county and state level. I assure you there are programs for folks who are motivated and inspired to lean in. And then I would go to, you know, most of us uh, who are listening in on, on this show, we have a bank account, uh, a, a credit union account somewhere. And I would lean into the folks where I have my resources. I would challenge them to step up with me in some regard and what I'm trying to do in my community. Otherwise, I'd investigate putting my resources elsewhere. So everyone has an obligation and an opportunity to help redress these historic wrongs. Stay right there for a moment. I want you to touch on that because banking is huge, right? And I think a lot of times we miss out on opportunities. We talk to people about these PPP, uh, you know, the PPP loans. and really it boiled down to bank relationship. And if you're talking about really transforming a block, a house, or even a community, the relationship of bank is really important. We touched upon it, but I need you to hit on that just a little bit more uh, so that maybe people can understand uh, the impact of what that means. Well, no doubt about it. I mean, look, uh, um, money doesn't just, uh, you know, we can talk about shaking trees but and money falling from the sky, but it does not. Uh, there are financial institutions, whether they be credit unions, uh, whether they be banks, uh, that, that number one, uh, have resources dedicated for us uh, to purchase, rehab, finance, uh, housing. And most of them have programs designed for first time home buyers and others. And, and I think a part of it is an edge. And we talk about, you know, we throw out these these terms, financial literacy and how efforts to renew and revive, I think we've got to really, you know, get beyond just the surface and we've got to explain to people, you know, the realities of tax implications, the realities of how to build and get a mortgage, how to finance new homes. I think, you know, part of our effort is no doubt about advocacy, Darren, but a lot of it is education and reimagining what financial literacy really is. One community talks about, you know, credit repair and getting basic bank accounts. Another community, when they talk about wealth building, it's all about tax policy, high, high finance, et cetera. I think we've got to reimagine and reopen our eyes and reacquaint ourselves with how do we really build uh, wealth in this country and in this climate and how do we really truly uh, close the wealth gap. Before we go, uh, we hear a little ding. That's my ding, too, for time is about up. But listen, before we do that, I want to give people the opportunity to lean into some of the work that you're doing. How do they get connected? How to get more information? Easy. We're easy to find. Greenlining Realty USA. My name is Lamel McMorris. I'm pretty accessible uh, on social media and through all the platforms uh, where my businesses can be found, whether it's Greenlining Realty USA that's based out of Chicago or Phase 2 Consulting. Uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have access to me. If you reach out, I assure you, I will respond. Well, Lamel, been great conversation, my brother. Definitely want to bring you back. Got to have more of this because uh, it's empowering, it's enlightening, enlightening, and most of all, it's transformative. Thanks for the work that you're doing, and uh, hope to get up with you soon, bro. No, Darren, thank you for the work that you're doing, and especially the information that you bring into our community. Hey, thanks much, brother. All right, Lamel McMorris, our guest, founding principal of Greenlining Realty USA. And listen, we got more on the social justice forums. Just gonna take a quick break. Be back in a few. to the show, Sane Energy Project is a not-for-profit organization that's opposing the development, transport, and export of fracked grass. Sane Energy's mission is to build a potent grassroots movement 
pushing for a rapid and just transition to 100% publicly owned renewable and sustainable energy in New York. Sharing now a little bit more about the work is, uh, is the Just Transition organizer at Sane Energy, Anna Somo. And uh, Anna, good to have you. Good morning, Darren. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And so uh, talk about an issue that's very important to New Yorkers from your perspective. Uh, share with us a little bit about the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. So Sane Energy Project um, is a tiny but mighty justice organization that works, as you said, to fight fracked gas infrastructure and instead advocate for the development and utilization of renewable energy solutions. Um, it was formed in 2011, um, back when I was just in school and not working in the world by some of my amazing colleagues. Um, and it formed to fight against the Spectra pipeline. Um, and that fight we actually lost. And it mm -hmm. goes under the Whitney Museum and into the West Village. But since then, we've also won a lot of fights such as Port Ambrose, which was a liquefied natural gas terminal that was proposed off the coast of Long Island. Um, and that got stopped through community outreach and organizing. And then also the Williams pipeline was proposed off the coast of the Rockaways. And that actually got stopped three times by um, activists and organizers. And Okay. No, I'm sorry. I, I was going. I, I thought you took a break for a second, but I'll just ask a question and you help me out. When you talk about the work actually being stopped by activists and organizers, what do you contribute to being the key factor in getting this work stopped? Well, I think it really takes a diversity of tactics, and that's one of the amazing things about community organizing is that it's very fluid and it changes based on what the needs are. So we do everything from community outreach, which means like knocking on people's doors and handing out flyers, to having meetings with elected officials to try to get policies put in place that would protect the environment. So it really is a grassroots organizing approach, which means getting education as much as we can in the communities that are affected and then going all the way up the chains of power from there. So we've done direct action and protest. We've had people locked down to construction sites to try to shut down construction of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and then we've also had like people send in tons of public comments, right? We had over mm -hmm. 40,000 public comments against the North Brooklyn pipeline, which really goes to show like how much opposition there is. Um, and the piece I was saying earlier about the Williams pipeline, the wonderful thing is that we've seen this kind of organizing work before. So the Williams pipeline, people were really concerned that it would poison the waters off the coast of the Rockaways, right? So there was a really strong community grassroots outreach push for that. People started organizing and we beat the Williams pipeline and it tried to come back. It was like a zombie pipeline. It tried to come back two other times through different bureaucratic like kind of technicalities, but we beat it three times. And because we beat that pipeline, there's now an offshore wind farm being proposed for the off the coast of the Rockaways instead, which is much healthier for our planet. Yeah. And when you talk about public awareness, I know that's a great uh, responsibility uh, of your organization, really creating that public awareness. What do you find when it comes to dealing with this issue of fracking and, and the public? Is the, is the general public generally aware of what's going on or does it really take a great sounding of the alarm? I think one interesting thing about fracking in New York State specifically is that fracking itself actually got banned back in 2015. And that was because of, again, grassroots organizing and community organizing. And so a lot of folks don't realize that just because fracking is banned in New York State, these companies are still trying to bring fracked gas in to our communities, right? So the danger is still there. And so a lot of folks may know that fracking is banned, but not realize that some of the dangers of fracked gas are still um, threatening people in New York City. So it's a little bit of an educating curve on that information like, well, fracking itself is still happening. A lot of the fracking occurs in Pennsylvania. So we need to be in solidarity with the fracked communities who are being poisoned and uh, harmed in Pennsylvania. The director of Sane Energy Project, Kim Fracek, um, is an amazing organizer and comes from Pennsylvania um, where her mother actually can't drink her water, her tap water because of fracking. So it really does impact communities. And that's the kind of thing that we need to educate people on. Um, and 
some folks may not really care about fracking that much, um, may not think that it's an important issue in terms of the climate, but it really is. And we've recently had the IPCC report come out um, just um, in advance of this big climate conference coming up COP26. And that report really highlighted how crucial it is to get off of fracked gas. Methane is the primary component of fracked gas. And it was really highlighted how methane is one of the worst greenhouse gases in terms of climate change. It's even worse than CO2. So people, I think, vaguely know that fracking is bad. Before I got involved in this work, I vaguely associated that fracking is bad. But it took me some time to really learn how bad it is and the fact that even if fracking is not happening in your community, the use of fracked gas is still really harmful just on a local level and then on a, on a global climate level as well. Because that's the thing about climate change is it's going to affect every single person alive. And for those who have more privilege and more power, it's really important that we try to advocate for communities that are being exploited, you know, use our privilege and power to try to stop the effects of climate change for those that will be disproportionately affected. Yeah. Right now, I know that you're really uh, sounding the alarm again, talking about National Grid in Brooklyn. Uh, bring our viewers up to speed with uh, you taking on National Grid and what's going on in Brooklyn. Yeah. So the North Brooklyn pipeline is being built by National Grid in Brooklyn. It starts in Brownsville, which is where my mom lives. And there's a really amazing community organization called Brownsville Green Justice that's fighting it locally there. And then it goes up through Bed-Stuy, Williamsburg, uh, Bushwick, and into Greenpoint. And there's a National Grid facility in Greenpoint, which they're trying to bring this fracked gas to through all these communities. Um, and as I said, fracked gas proposes a lot of dangers. So so um, methane can cause respiratory illness. And these communities, you know, it's largely communities of color and working class communities. And we know that disproportionately COVID rates are higher in marginalized communities, right? These are environmental justice communities that have been fighting against environmental racism and disproportionate health effects for a really long time. So that's why we're fighting so hard to advocate for renewables instead and for shutting down the North Brooklyn pipeline because communities deserve investment into healing, better health care, more green spaces, and not more fossil fuel infrastructure, you know? And the kicker is that National Grid has also recently gotten permission from New York State government, the Public Service Commission, to raise our gas bills. So people all over New York City are going to actually be paying to poison the folks in Brooklyn with this pipeline. And it is over 150,000 folks that live right next to the pipeline. Brooklyn's really big, you know, so it doesn't make sense for us to allow a company to not only make us pay for it, but just have this toxic infrastructure in so many backyards. What's the response of elected officials when we uh, when you have this conversation? Obviously, some of them, uh, I'm sure, are getting new revelation and information when it comes to this. Absolutely. So we recently actually had an exciting uh, press conference where Senator Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, actually came out against this pipeline. And so even from the highest levels of government, like the Senate Majority Leader, all the way down to the former city council members, we had unanimous support in the city council. Um, a lot of community members, um, or rather elected officials in the local communities that are impacted by this pipeline have come out really strongly against it, come out to our rallies, given talks, you know? Um, and so it's clear that because elected officials are listening to the constituents in these areas, the constituents don't want it, that means the elected officials are going to oppose it as well. And so talk to us about what we can do right now. I mean, how do you, how does the public become more involved, more engaged, and really raising their voice in something that is so uh, impactful to so many people? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, one thing that we're asking everyone in New York City who pays a national grid bill to do is join our gas bill strike. So we are actually refusing to pay for the North Brooklyn pipeline and other fracked gas projects that National Grid wants us to pay for by raising our bills. Um, and so you can find more information about that at nonbkpipeline.org strike. And what we're doing basically is we're 
were saying you should withhold $66 from your national grid gas bill because that's about how much each New Yorker who pays for national grid will pay for this pipeline over time. So we're not asking you to not pay your whole gas bill. That has a lot more risks involved for strikers, but just keep that balance owed of $66 from month to month, right? Because we're saying, you know what? You can't have our money to poison our communities. You can't have our community to poison our planet. Um, and so that's why we're striking. And if you want to really throw down and get involved, we do outreach all the time. We do flyering. We do phone banking. So if you want to volunteer with us, we can get you on board, figure out what's the best way for you to plug in and protect uh, Brooklyn communities and protect the climate. Um, but we do ask, even for folks I know that you all are based in the Bronx, if you pay a national grid gas bill and you're in New York City, your bill has already started to go up to pay for this pipeline. So we really want to strike and get people to prove we won't pay for this pipeline. And strikes have worked in the past. There was a con ed strike, I believe it was back in the 70s. And there was like a million strikers or a really strong number. And con ed actually had to pay people back for the damage they caused. So people power does work. And so that's yeah. why we're pushing this so hard to really get people to join our strike and join our outreach and movement uh, to fight against this pipeline. And, and what you talk about when it comes to the pipeline, I know that you say that the pipeline is also racist. I want you to make it very clear to people how you view the pipeline as being racist. Yeah, absolutely. There's this map that I believe there's an amazing coalition called Frack Out of Brooklyn. And I believe that them or Mi Casa Resiste, another great coalition, um, made a map that shows the route of the pipeline and it overlays it with the communities of color. And it's almost identical, really. So this company, National Grid, they picked a route of this pipeline that they thought would be least resistance, right? They picked on communities that are already facing so much oppression that they thought these folks will not have enough energy, enough time, enough resources to fight back, right? And that's how it's environmental racism because it's going through communities of color that have been facing legacies of environmental racism for a really long time. And so that's why it's so important that we do local community outreach, not only just like organizations like St. Energy Project that have a lot of background into fracking and been fighting fracking for a long time. We don't wanna advocate for communities. We wanna empower communities to advocate for themselves. People who have been living in Bushwick and Brownsville and Bed-Stuy and Greenpoint for generations. These are the folks that we want to advocate for themselves, empower themselves to fight back, right? Um, but it really is just an act of environmental racism by National Grid. And it's something that we see over and over again is that toxic infrastructure projects are placed in communities that are communities of color and working class communities. Um, and you know, it really goes back to colonization, the way that um, extraction happens in the global south and then consumption happens in the global north. You know, it's patterns that we've seen for years and years. And so we're trying to fight back against environmental racism and colonization by shutting down this pipeline. Yeah, and I know our viewers will be getting an opportunity to see uh, exactly where these communities are that are gonna be actually impacted. But I think you touch upon something it's really profound and, and not really profound for us because we talk about this all the time, but profound in the, in the minds of so many other people because when we talk about fracking and we talk about all this unjust environmental racism, it always does occur in those communities of color where we talk about uh, you know, pockets of people who are really dedicated to trying to live their best life but seem, seem to find themselves having to deal with the worst challenges because everything seems to be pushed upon them. Agree? Yeah, absolutely. And just as an example, on either end of this pipeline, so Brownsville, which is where it starts, is 99% population of color, and it also has the lowest life expectancy in all of New York City, right? This is an example of how environmental racism really affects people's health and lives. And then on the other end of the pipeline, Greenpoint, specifically on Newtown Creek, which is right next to that National Grid facility, there was the largest um, North American oil spill there back in, I believe, the 70s. And so people are still dealing with the toxins of that. And it's a super fun site. Um, and so that makes people sick. And it's really difficult because corporations 
connections have so much power, they're strategic and making it really difficult to make the direct connection between their pollution and the fact that people are getting sick in those areas. But people that live there and people that organize there understand that these multi-billion dollar international companies with so much power and so much influence are really directly making people sick and getting away with it, you know? And again, that just points to the power and the necessity of organizing against these projects. Yeah, and I know that you've got some things happening in the near future. So uh, before we wrap up, please get an opportunity to share with our viewers how uh, you, they can take part and know a little bit about what's happening in the near future. Absolutely. So you can follow our coalition on social media. That's at no NBK pipeline on Twitter and Instagram. Um, for Facebook, it's no North Brooklyn pipeline coalition. You can go to our website at www no nbkpipeline.org. Please join our gas bill strike. You can uh, send us a message if you want to get more involved with organizing. We want to have a protest soon because National Grid, this company, even though they are directly poisoning communities of color, somehow they have become a primary sponsor of this upcoming climate conference and talk about hypocrisy, right? They're claiming to be a climate leader, talking about, oh, all the great work they're gonna do for climate solutions while still building a fracked gas pipeline that emits methane in communities of color in Brooklyn. So that just goes to show how evil and how tricky these corporations are. So if you wanna come out to a protest, be on the lookout, we'll have information out soon about that. But we continually do outreach if people wanna organize. We always have space for more folks. And I also want wanted to mention, <clears throat> excuse me, that there is a pipeline that comes from Westchester and goes through the Bronx as well. Um, and we do not organize around that as much because we are so much based in Brooklyn. But if you want more information around this, there's not much organizing going on right now about this. But we know that folks in the Bronx want to protect their communities, protect their families. So please reach out to us at Sane Energy Project and we can give you information. We can give you resources if you want to organize against that as well. Most definitely, we appreciate the information. That's why we bring you to the show, right? To talk about the issues and to really uh, make our public aware. That's part of what we want to do. We want to create public awareness. And so, Anna, you've done that uh, for us today. And thank you so much for being with us, Anna Somo. Thank you so much, Darren. Have a great day. All righty. Well, listen, I want you to stay with us because we continue on the social justice forums, continuing the topic of conversation, promoting civic engagement, but most of all, bringing awareness. Talk to you in a few. And welcome back to the show. The people who work the hardest throughout the pandemic and are the backbones of our economy, sometimes are the most vulnerable to financial hardship as well as insecurity. Now, this past year has made the economic inequality and vulnerability abundantly clear that a shifting needs to be thought of in designing a system that works for everyone. In April of 2019, social worker and co-founder of Basic Income NYC, Diane Pagin and 2020 candidate for U.S. Congress, James Felton, they, Keith, they also came together with the goal of organizing a public event and the show of force and inclusion for basic income. Joining us now to share a little bit more is the co-founder of Basic Income March, Diane Pagin. And uh, Diane, good to have you. Hi, Darren. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I guess when we talk about the work that you're doing, it's really about economic equality for everyone. Um, and so when did you start to really get involved in this whole thing about economic equality? Well, economic equality in general, I got interested in it probably as a much younger person in my 20s. I was always interested in helping people and I did a lot of volunteer work and such. And I got interested in, uh, in, in it in earnest when I uh, went to social work school at uh, Fordham University in, uh, in New York. And uh, during my time there, I was introduced to the idea of a universal basic income by someone who had worked on it for many decades. And I, I just 
you know, thinking about what what it was like as a social worker, you know, uh, meeting people who really the their core problem was they didn't have enough money. Um, but all that existed for them was non cash services that they, you know, sometimes they didn't even need. I, I got more and more interested in universal basic income. So I've been I I guess I've been interested in figuring out how to meet everybody's needs in a dignified way for a couple of decades. Yeah. And so now as we look at the work that you're doing, you're really trying to raise awareness when it comes to the issue of basic income. And for you, what does that look like to have to be able to just have basic income? Uh, a basic income is uh, it's it's uh, an agreed upon amount of money that uh, that a society decides would be adequate to meet basic survival needs. And it's distributed with no conditions. So that's the, the key concept is that there are no conditions to get the basic income is how generally most of us who are, who, who are uh, pro uh, basic income think about it. Um, so it would be unconditional, adequate to meet a certain degree of basic human needs. So no, one is, no one's life and health is in danger due to having no money. Um, and it goes to everyone in a given society or a given district or a, diff a given city or a given nation, depending on how you're designing it. Yeah. That's, that's so, really what it is. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, when it comes to policies, there's some policies that really get up under your skin. So uh, share with me about some of the policies and the initiatives that you really are fighting for right now. Well, so I'm working. I'm I'm working with an organization called Income Movement, and um, Income Movement is a national organization, um, and we are we're very very hopeful about some of the federal policy uh, improvements that have gone on. You know, in COVID, uh, there's been substantial. Uh, veil has been pulled off of our national programs um similar to what happened actually during the great depression when uh charitable organizations insisted in the 1920s that they could that that if only they got the money from the federal government that they could provide for the basic human needs of of the people during uh times of economic strife and of course uh they lost that argument and because we were able to prove that they couldn't do it um, and that cash transfers were necessary, we got the Social Security Act. So we're really hopeful now, you know, fast forward about, I guess, 90 years or so. Um, we're, we're very, very hopeful because basic income has had a real resurgence. Um, and it started before COVID, several years before COVID-19. Um, but COVID-19 and the shutdown and people losing their jobs and having to stay home and all of that, um, it really highlighted and pulled the veil off the idea that we have a, a functioning adequate safety net. Um, and it, it has become painfully obvious that we have no functioning national safety net. And while from state to state, some states do a little bit better than others. Um, there is no state that uh, distributes a, an adequate cash supplement to all of its people, and we have uh, poverty in every state. Um, so we're very, very hopeful about some of the things that have come out this, this year, in part because of income movement's advocacy and um, growing these conversations, developing these conversations with federal legislators, there is now uh, legis legislation that has been um, introduced by Representative, Representative Omar um, called the Support Act. It's been co-sponsored by Jamal Bowman, and um, she is all on board for a basic income that would have a quantity going to adults and a quantity going to children. 
Um, we also just had the victory of the expanded child tax credit, which has, uh, you know, the data coming in is saying that we are making a significant shift in, in reducing poverty in, in uh, families with children. So we're, you know, we're continuing to do that work because uh, just because we've had a few victories doesn't mean that we can relax. <laughs> no, but I know that you got a few victories and you want a few more. And with that, you've got a march that's also planned as well, trying to uh, drum up support, raise the banner of awareness for people. Uh, talk to us about the march. Sure. So the Basic Income March, this is the third annual Basic Income March. The first one was in 2019, as I said. And we also had a scaled down version of the march last year. Um, where we didn't move around so much and we were in Manhattan. Um, we actually had uh, two uh, congressional, um, not congressional, two city council candidates uh, came who were in support of a, of a universal basic income. One of them was uh, Althea Stevens, who has now won her seat in the city council and she is pro basic income. Um, we had uh, lots of representation from the community, community leaders who are not just politicians or not just seeking to, to win a political office, but they are actually, they have a track record of working in their communities to feed people and make sure people have what they need. Um, so uh, in 2021, we're going to march up Amsterdam Avenue on September 25th. The start point is West 123rd Street and Amsterdam Avenue. We're going to have, uh, we're going to get together there and, uh, you know, get powered up. And then we're going to march up Amsterdam Avenue to 143rd. Um, 143rd is, and Amsterdam has a plaza there. Uh, it's a carless pedestrian plaza called Johnny Hartman Plaza. And we're gonna set up there and have a rally. We'll have some music. We're gonna have a marching, a youth marching band called the Marching Cobras who are based in Harlem. And uh, we'll have speakers. Uh, we're gonna have activities and we're gonna have a lot of community groups give out information about what they're working on too. As we collaborate with a lot of uh, community, community work. Yeah. And I know that, you know, this march is not just a march, it's a march with an intention. And part of that intention is really uh, to bring this awareness, but not only to bring awareness in this area, but also to look at who's being affected, those people who, you know, because this really plays in two areas. I talk, it talks about poverty, uh, education, and, um, you know, just the quality of life. Uh, give us a little bit about the effect of basic income and, and what it has uh, when it comes to poverty education and basic life sure so there's been there there's been at this point there's there's numerous pilots uh basic income pilots with uh, taking small samples of people um and distributing an unconditional amount of money to them for a period of time for example stockton california for example um uh ontario uh canada although that one is you know, that's a longer story, but uh, but the bottom line of it is that everywhere a pilot has been done and there, there's plenty of, you can, you can definitely get, you know, plenty of information as to where pilots have been conducted. Um, everywhere that it happens, the, the, the data that comes back records that people are less stress, people are reporting less stress, better parenting, better school attendance. And even though a lot of the talking heads that, that oppose a basic income often will raise the question, oh, well, no one will work. You have to understand, we need for people to start challenging that assumption because basically what happens is in every pilot, the, the paid work increases people find better work so sometimes sometimes parents drop temporarily out of a job that isn't satisfying or it's not making sense for their family but they regroup they get more education 
they get what they need to be successful in interviews and they go back out and they get better employment. And this is across the board in, in virtually every pilot, all the data that, that we get back. And because of, because of the, the increasing popularity of the concept, a lot of, there are now, I think around 20 plus pilots in the planning stages all across the United States, one of which is in Hudson, New York, another which is in, um, in um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There's another one in Newark, New Jersey with uh, Mayor Baraka. So there are plenty, there's plenty of data now that shows that when you distribute small adequate amounts of income to people without creating onerous bureaucracy, that individuals are the best agents of how to use money, not large conglomerates, and that it's really the best way to solve problems. So, you know, that's to your point about education and poverty and such. It's really just really the most efficient way to solve a person's economic problem is to give them money. And when I say give, I'm not saying give as in a gift. I'm saying give them the resources that they are owed, basically, because they produce. You can't say it any better than that. I mean, I think when you really talk about it, we have to really do better in terms of making sure that people have the basic needs uh, in life. And giving people a basic income in America shouldn't be so hard. Diana, I want to thank you for your time with us here on the show today. And certainly it's been uh, great to have you. Before we go real quickly, let's talk about how people can get connected to you. So we would like and anyone that's interested in coming to the March, you can go to basicincomemarch.com and you click on the link that says join an event. Um, and you look for the New York City March because there's more than one March. There are marches in other cities as well. And you can RSVP. And once you RSVP, you'll start getting uh, a weekly email from us with uh, information that you can use. The March, it's free to participate. And like I said, we're meeting at, I don't think I said the meeting time. We're meeting at 1230 on Saturday, September 25th at West 123rd in Amsterdam. And if people want to you know, really social media is, is wonderful. We're on social media at income underscore movement and social media is great, uh, but it's not a substitute for feet on the ground. So right. come march with us and let's show them that we know the deal. <laughs> and we know that we're going to make it happen. That's right. Well, Diane, thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forums, enjoying the conversation and really bringing some enlightenment to our viewers about the Basic Income and Basic Income March. Uh, Diane Pagin, our guest here, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks a lot. I'll see you at the March. At the march. Well, I want to let our viewers know that we have come to the end of our Social Justice Forum show. We certainly hope uh, that you enjoyed this week's discussion as we continue to bring various topics to you to enlighten you and also to make sure uh, that you're getting all of the information that's going on around our community. So much is happening, uh, but we want to make sure that we're bringing it a, a little bit closer to you. Now, if you want to catch the show again, the recablecast here on BronxNet TV or at BronxNet.org, we encourage you to see, get connected to us. And if you want to present your point of view, also don't hesitate to get to us at Bronxnet TV on social media. There you can also be able to share uh, the information and share in on, the, uh, on what you saw. I'm Darren Jaime. Join us next week. We're going to elevate the conversation a little bit more, go a little bit higher, go a little bit deeper, and promote some civic engagement. Thank you for watching the Social Justice Forums. We'll catch you on the next one.